Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the online show where we dive into the municipal insights of political leaders from across Canada. Our mission on this show is quite simple. Shine a light on the dedicated individuals who day in and day out work around the council table to shape the communities that they and we call home. Joining us for today's episode, our first of November 2024, is from the City of London, Ontario, Councillor Skylar Frank. Located in the heart of southwestern Ontario and between Toronto and Detroit, London is one of Canada's fastest growing and increasingly diverse cities. With a diverse population of over a half a million people, London, Ontario is currently the 11th largest city in Canada and offers its residents and visitors big city appeal mixed with small town charm. Whether you're a growing business interested in expanding to London, a family looking for an affordable community to buy a home, an individual seeking a career opportunity, or a student exploring top-rated post-secondary schools, you'll quickly discover why you should call London, Ontario home. Are you passionate about local governance and municipal issues? Do you believe in the power of community-driven conversations? Then join us at the Cross Border Network, where we bring together voices from across Canada to shine a spotlight on the challenges and the triumphs of our municipalities. But we need your support to keep the conversation going. Visit crossborderinterviews.ca today to show your support by backing the show monthly or making a one-time annual donation. Your contribution will help us grow and expand our reach, bringing important stories to even more listeners across the nation. Together, we can make a difference. Together, we can amplify the voices of local communities. Together, we can shape a brighter future for all. Cross Border Network, where local matters and your support counts. Visit us today at crossborderinterviews.ca. Councillor, I want to thank you so much for sitting down with me this morning and talking about yourself and talking about the City of London. But I want to start by getting to know the the person behind the persona a little bit, if you don't mind. Where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Skylar? Mm, I'm sure many people have a similar an- answer, but I feel like definitely my parents, my family. Uh, growing up, my parents were pretty engaged in the community. And I remember I attended my first protest in the 90s um, when the Harris government was doing some sort of labor action against the teachers. I don't really remember exactly what it was, but I remember like coloring in a poster and then going like staying beside my teachers and walking outside of the school. Um, And that was, you know, through my mom's encouragement because she thought that was really important for us to show solidarity, even though she's not a teacher and we don't have any teachers in our family. Um, so I'd say pr- definitely for my parents, we talked about politics around the table. We talked about how do you improve society, um, you know, had criticism about various levels of government. Um, yeah, so I'd say it was early on. And then at, at the same time, they're really into going outside. So on weekends, instead of watching cartoons in the morning, I got to go for hikes, which at the time I hated. But now I really like reflect on very fondly. So um, that instilled a lot of love for nature, which is another part of um, my career path. So why did you, why was politics the 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 field that you wanted to get into? So you got you you were first elected in twenty twenty two. So this is your mm-hmm. first term. We're halfway through that first term. Literally, as we're talking, we just passed that halfway mark. What was it about the political draw that brought you into the arena? Because Looking through your background, you could have gone provincially, you could have gone mm-hmm. federally, but you chose municipal. What was mm-hmm. it about the political realm that you wanted to give back that way and the decision to give back municipally rather than the other levels? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so... um Prior to becoming a city councillor, I worked in the environmental sector. So I ran an environmental charity called the London Environmental Network. And before that, I worked at Reforce London, which was a tree planting charity. Um, And through my work there, it was about 10 years. um, We ran a bunch of programs and we had a nice impact locally. But um, it kind of came to a head for me in 2018 when um, at the provincial level, the Conservatives were elected and cancelled all cap and trade, which there was going to be tons of revenue for the environmental sector from cap and trade, including some programs that we were going to launch that got cancelled. And at that point, I just started to become very frustrated because as much good local impact we could have, it could be wiped out in a second, depending on who is in, in office. 
Um, and so that kind of started to to get me thinking about politics. Um, and then I actually really don't like parties, partisanship. I think parties are probably one of my least favorite parts about a democracy. Um, and at the municipal level in Ontario, there are no parties, although there are party allegiances. And um, I really like the idea of running for things that I care about and the community cares about and not feeling that I have to say something that somebody else wants me to say because I'm part of their party. So um, I really like the flexibility that municipal office provides. And of course, it's um, we call it the government of proximity. Yeah. You know, you walk outside your house and almost everything you see is municipal government, except for really like schools and hospitals. But the rest is all us transit, garbage pickup, snow removal. Um, so I couldn't think of something that would have a higher impact on people's lives than municipal government. I feel like the former president of FCM, Scott Pierce's ears are ringing because that was his big claim to fame to always talk about the government of proximity. And I almost I called it. the show that. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, so you, you decide to put your name forward prior to 2022 because you don't just wake up the day of nomination. You say, I'm going to put my name forward. What factors went into deciding that 2022 would be the best election for you to finally say, okay, this is my time. This is the time where I can make the biggest impact. Was there a resignation or was there something locally going on from a municipal standpoint? We're going to talk about sort of the provincial creep here in a few seconds, but was there something mun municipally going on that you said, I want to try to address this. And I think I, Skylar, would be best to uh, serve the people of London by doing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, multiple reasons. So I think in politics, many people say timing is everything. Yeah. Um, and so for me, you know, I had been in the environmental sector for about 10 years, I was getting kind of frustrated. And I, I didn't like showing up at work like that. And so I started to you know, again, think about other options, including politics. Um, the previous counselor in my ward, so Ward 11, uh, was Steve Turner, and he had done two terms, uh, and he had another full-time job that um, he's very good at. And so I actually kind of went up to him and was like, hey, are you running again? Because her his politics and mine are very similar, and I didn't want to run against him. Like, I, I didn't want to neutralize, like, essentially somebody I agree with. So I had a conversation, and, and um uh, arrived at the conclusion that he was okay if I ran, he wouldn't run again, uh, which was really nice. And he ended up endorsing me at the end. Um, so that kind of opened up the spot. It's hard to run uh, against an incumbent, as people know. So it's easier when it's an open field. And then I had kind of put in the time in London. So I grew up actually in Georgetown near Toronto. And then I moved to London for school. And so I'd been in London at that point for about 10 years, um, no, 12 years. And I had I think integrated myself into the community, understood what the needs were. I had a lot of good relationships with people across the city, but in my ward specifically. And at that point, I felt that I had enough knowledge and confidence to be able to represent them effectively. Um, of course, yeah, I think people can always do a better job. But uh, at that point, I felt, you know, I really know this community. So I think those kind of all lined up. And then I ended up, uh, I don't know if this shows up in any of my bios, but I ended up running during the campaign. I was nine months pregnant um, and canvassing. Uh, so in a weird way, it timed out because I was able to go on mat leave and then also campaign, which I think people don't think gives you extra time, but it creates like weird blocks of time where you can go out and canvass. So I recently spoke to Katie Grigg from Azora Township, who literally had her child between when she got elected to when she got sworn in. So the transition between being not uh, a pregnant mother to not being a pregnant mother was very quick for you. And I hate to ask the quest this type of question because it's not important to me, but there are people out there. We saw yeah. stories in Yukon and even in Alberta where people where women brought their kids, their young children to council meetings and they were yelled at. And mm -hmm. to me that that's irresponsible. And you have the right to you were elected and if you have to bring your kids there, you bring your kids there. Mm -hmm. When you decide to put your name on the ballot, knowing you were pregnant, mm -hmm. was that ever something that crossed your mind that said, am I going to be able to fully do this job or am I ever able to, going to be able to do a be a mom to this child as well? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think I assume, I don't know, I can speak for every parent, but I'm sure that everyone who has kids probably runs through that. Like everyone 
that I know generally, well, not everyone, there's some people that are stay-at-home parents, but um, generally but, works. So. But it's harder for women when you're, you're pregnant and you give birth to a child to be elected to a municipal council because you hate to be the, the, the a-hole in this question, but there's more pressure on women to perform better than their male counterparts in that role, is there not? Yeah, I mean, I would agree. Um, okay. And there's and I would too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't think everyone would. But, uh, and, you know, there's less women in politics. And I think one of the reasons is that, like, people um, perhaps wouldn't want to put their name on the ballot if they're planning on having a family because they'd be like, oh, well, can I be of service to my community if I also have to spend time with my child? And um, I guess I arrogantly thought I could do it all. I don't think everyone thinks Good that. Uh, again, but uh, yeah, so I I um, started my campaign in May. I filed, and then I gave birth in August. I took like three weeks off the campaign, and then I was back canvassing. Uh, and the election was in October, so I had like a two month old. Actually, there's like videos of me at my election night party dancing with my like three month old in my arm, and like at my swearing in ceremony, I had my little three month old. He had a uh, he had a little face mask on because it was still COVIDy, but um, yeah, so. But has I don't know. it been what you people, expected, though? Has, has um, the last so two far. years as a municipal politician been what you expected? Because you, you get elected, and I hate to say post-COVID because there's COVID still around, but it, it, after a pandemic where a lot of things have changed in the municipal realm, and I can imagine what you expected and what you got are probably two different things. Yeah, it's interesting. So this is my first time on council. So this yeah. is all I kind of know firsthand experience. But then I talked to other colleagues who is their second or third term on council. And they're like, Oh, my God, everything is so different. Because they had like, there's some people done like pre pandemic, and then they did council pretty much mostly on zoom during the COVID time, more COVID times. And then now they're back, but then lots of things have changed. So it's like, Voter turnout is way down in London. I think our, our turnout was what was that, like 25%. And I think that's pretty much across, you know, Ontario and perhaps the country. Um, and like people are really angry these days, like so full of rage. And then online, you throw in social media has gotten super toxic. So um, I, it is kind of what I expected. Um, I'm I enjoy it. I like, you know, trying to find solutions and debating different ideas, um, responding to constituent needs and trying to help them. But it definitely is. Um, I think some of the online stuff I didn't expect to be as bad as it is. I want to talk about solutions for a few seconds, if you don't mind, because after two years, you've come to the realization that you have to make some very tough decisions around that council table and social media. If you watch it as a, on a regular basis, you understand that not a hundred percent of the people are going to agree on every single thing that you vote on. Mm. How do you as a counselor, knowing that you're only one vote, make the tough decisions knowing that sometimes people are going to be upset with you. Mm. Yeah. I mean, um, I've got, I'm looking at it right now. Actually, I have a note from the previous counselor, Steve Turner. He wrote me a note and left it on the desk so that when I moved into the office the, you know, I had a couple notes and one of them was his. And he said, you know, that you're going to be faced with some really tough challenges, but if you listen to your heart and follow what you believe in, it will be a lot easier and I think that's great advice because, um, you know, you get elected because people believe that you can represent them, that maybe you have similar values or similar um, concept. And you still get lots of information from residents during votes. So, you know, I factor that in. But at the end of the day, I was elected because of my perspective. And so um, for like some tough votes, um, I really have to reflect and think, like, is this what I think is right? And I like I'd rather do that than just be like, oh, well, I got 100 votes or 100 emails who said to vote like this. I'm only 10 to vote for like that. Therefore, I'm going to vote for the 100. I don't really do my voting that way. Why not? Because and I hate to ask the stupid follow up question there, but majority people want something. You have your gut. And I agree. I would I would say that you have to follow your gut in any decision you make. And that's my own personal belief. But as a municipal councillor, aren't you there to represent the people who have elected you, not your yeah, gut who's absolutely. elected you? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I was elected, um, I got, what was it, like 58% of the vote. And I had, I have to look it up, like 3,800 votes. Yeah. Um, my ward is 30,000 people. 
Um, so if I get 100 emails, that's not the majority of my ward. That's not the majority of people who voted for me. That's just 100 people who, you know, read something in the newspaper and had a perspective on it, which I don't discount. I appreciate the feedback. Sometimes I agree with it. Sometimes I don't. Sometimes it makes me pause and think. Um, but at the end of the day, like 100 votes is not representative of my community. And I find when people like not I don't think that many people do it that way. I think, again, a lot of people in council follow their gut. Um, but uh, I don't think that that is what people are elected for. Like you're a representative. So you are like, you are supposed to have some of your own opinions, which is yeah. why you ran and why you were chosen. So. Do you believe there's an apathy when it comes to municipal politics in our country right now? I think at all levels. Yeah. Like I definitely, I get people being like, uh, I emailed you about this planning thing and you still voted for it. And therefore, why did I bother? And I'm like, well, you know, like you, you, a lot of people, especially with that concept, they don't necessarily want development in their neighborhood which I can appreciate it changes it. It might, you know, be disruptive during construction. Maybe they don't want an apartment building in a, an area with mostly single family homes. At the same time, I'm looking at it from a city issue. We need housing. Yeah. We need infill. I don't want urban sprawl. So unfortunately I will probably vote to support an apartment building in your neighborhood. And I can appreciate difficulty. I can try and work with the developer to limit as much as possible, try and make some concessions, but I'm not going to vote something down because somebody just doesn't really like it. So I get people then that follow up that say, why did I bother emailing you? You don't care. But I do care. I just, you know, have to evaluate more information. Do you, do you find it challenging to, actually, I'm going to rephrase this question. How important is it for you to talk to everyone? Because while you got elected by 58% of the vote, that's 10% at, if you have 30,000 people in your district, 3,000 3, people voted for you. 27,000 people potentially did not vote for you or just did not get get off the couch and go and cast their ballot. How important is it for you to listen to every single one of those people who do actually engage with you respectfully? And I say that with the caveat that they are engaging with you respectfully, not yelling at you, not screaming and not cursing at you, but respectfully and a respectful dialogue. Because some people just want to be heard and they want their concerns to be addressed, even if you as a counselor might not be able to do anything or might not be able to vote in the way that they wish you would to want to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I do my best. So I get lots of emails, phone calls, you know, Facebook messages or comments. Um, and I do my best to try to respond to them all. And then if they ask for a follow up or a phone call, have a conversation because I don't think it's wasted. Even when I, I'll get an email from somebody that says like, I completely disagree with you. Um, this is why. And I can't believe you'd vote that way. But I want to talk about it. I'll give them a call because I'd rather have the discussion. Maybe I don't know something that they know, maybe, you know, vice versa. I might know something more about the issue than they do. And if we can have a dialogue on it, it's a bit better. I find, again, on the phone or meeting somebody in person um, really reduces a lot of mistrust and disinformation. And we can just chat about it like two normal human beings. Um but it is important, like for me, when I canvassed, I wanted to, and I did this, I, I knocked on every single door in my ward for the, everything that I could get into. So there's some buildings I wasn't like apartment buildings I couldn't get into. I'd call the super, no one was there, but like every townhome, every house, and then there's still apartments that I could get into. I knocked on every door because I wanted to understand what was going on and every neighborhood has different issues. So without having those conversations, then like... I don't know. At that point, do you really know your area? Like if you're not talking right. to everyone. Do you, do you find it hard balancing the needs of the greater London city with your district? Because while you're elected by the people in your ward, you're there to represent the entire city as well. And you have to make decisions based on the entire city and not look at it through a local ward lens. Does that get challenging when you're trying to make your community, your area, your ward a little bit better every time that you make a decision? Mm, yeah, definitely. I think you know, it comes up a lot. Like I'd say the ones I can think of off the top of my head are you know, development applications for infill because my area is landlocked. It's yeah. uh, some of the older stock. So um, infill projects people don't really like. But again, we have a city need for more housing. Um, issues with homelessness, so like where to put things that we call service depots. Um, we put them in various parks and they're like pop up. Uh, food, water, porta potties. And so they kind of rotate around. So like people don't really want them in their neighborhoods. Um, another one is affordable housing projects. So I've got a couple new ones coming out in my ward. And again, people don't, you know, some people are like, this is wonderful. I'm so excited. And other people don't want them. 
And then the other thing would be park infrastructure. So my ward just lost a hundred year old outdoor pool that served 30% of Londoners. So it was actually kind of like a citywide pool that we people would come to, but really my area, but it was in a floodplain and it kept failing. Um, and so that one I can understand it's like, my ward really want to keep it. And we did put a motion forward to try and just repair it, extend it a little bit more while we looked for other locations. Um, but at the end of the day, we have a limited budget. So we can't continue to spend tens of millions of dollars on something that is inoperable. Um, so yeah, I think it comes up. And then again, you kind of have to wear both hats. You're like, yeah, it's good for my ward. It's good for the city or it's good for the city. But, you know, my residents won't be that happy. But I, I, you know, I think that we we struggle across probably Canada, but in London, um, with oversaturation of services in certain wards. Uh, mine's not one of them. We don't we're not oversaturated in my area, but there are that um, wards that have a lot of social services, and uh, I think that's really tough too because I, ideally everything should be spread around the city. You have pools around the city, you have parks around the city. We should have services around the city, but. But at the end of the day, you don't have a limit, unlimited supply of money. And I'm assuming yeah. Doug Ford's not writing checks every morning to all the municipalities across the well, province. You know, he's going to give $200 to every resident in Ontario. Uh, so he's going to spend $3 billion that, that I could actually use that for homelessness. But I guess 200 bucks for people to pay off their credit card seems to be a high priority right now. I, I when I worked at Queens Park, uh, I I could just hear people screaming it when when we ever mentioned just giving people money. It just yeah. it, don't get me wrong, it's their money, but just when you could solve issues, it's a lot. It's a lot ch more challenging than just writing a check to somebody. Um, yeah. Before we turn to the city of London, some of the challenges that it faces, I have one last question. It's it's actually about Doug Ford. <laughs> um, when people do approach you as a counselor you know the role that your municipality plays in their lives. You know what you were responsible for and you know the jurisdictional role that the municipality plays. But I would hazard a guess that you deal with a lot of provincial issues as well when they come talking to you because they probably know you more than they know their MPP. How often do you get those provincial jurisdictional questions that you have to say, go talk to your MPP because that's not the responsibility of the municipality? Or do you deal with it because they know you more than they probably know their MPP. So they're probably willing to get, or probably better chance to getting a hold of you than their MPP. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I kind of do it case by case. So I do get a ton of emails and communication that is provincial or federal, um, but then we redirect them. I think like some, for example, that I won't really get too deep into is landlord tenant issues. So yeah. if I have people who are complaining about their landlord, I'm like, you know what, that's really uh, terrible. If I can do bylaw stuff, I can send them over to bylaw, then I do. But if not, then I have to connect them with their MPP. Um, but there are stuff like, you know, people in general just complaining about homelessness and then that we're not doing enough and the like, city needs to step up. And it's like we have a limited budget and we are trying not to increase the property tax so much to cover the cost of it, which, in my opinion, is what the provincial government wants is they want all the cities to pay for all the services. And really, they don't really want to pick up the bill. Um, and we we do what we can with what we have. My understanding is our homelessness portfolio is one point five percent of our entire operating budget. And so that's like, uh, you know, shelter spaces, um, outreach services, that kind of stuff. Uh, we have a bigger budget for like housing. We have social housing that we run, but for like direct homelessness, it's 1.5%. So um, we don't have limitless money. So occasionally those I'll, I'll try to navigate with a person. Um, but I do say at the end of the day, we don't have enough money to solve this problem. So talk to your MPP and talk to your MP. The issue I have though in London is um, like most urban centers, we have NDP MPPs and liberal uh, federal um, elect. So, yeah. I mean, that's different, but at the NDP level, it's like, go talk to your NDP MPP. They're going to agree with you. <laughs> so that's great, but uh, it's tough to kind of get them to then move the needle some days because they're in opposition. It's challenging. Uh, I want to turn to the city of London as a whole. And before I ask this first question, I'm going to preface it by saying this. This is a conversation between the councillor and myself. This is not a motion of council, not a direction of council, not a policy of council. This is her opinion and her opinion alone. That being said, it may line up with what's going on at council, but at the end of the day, it's still her opinion. She has one vote on the council. Councillor, in your opinion, what do you believe is the biggest challenge or challenges facing the city of London today as of recording this on October 30th? Um, I think it's almost universal that we can agree it's homelessness. 
uh you know i'd be well you know what some of my colleagues would disagree with that but um i think it's the thing that we get the most emails about uh it's the thing that we see the most visibly it has the most ripple effects into people's lives um you know a lot of people complain about um like not feeling safe in the downtown core areas. So uh, even though, but it's more like homelessness makes people feel uncomfortable. Of course, there are some issues where people have public safety issues, like genuine concerns. But I think there's a lot of people who just um, don't want to see open drug use or don't want to see people sleeping in doorways. So I would say that's our number one issue right now that we're trying to tackle. Of course, we have many others like all cities do. Yeah, so let's play in the sandbox of homelessness for a second, if you don't mind. We literally just got off the topic of it being a relatively because mental health addictions, homelessness, uh, housing supplies. It is a provincial jurisdictional issue. Mm -hmm. If the city picks up these issues, and I say these issues as in the macro issues, that's downloading onto your tax base. Yeah. How does the city of London, how do you see yourself, and I say you you as the royal you, navigating this without burdening the already strained tax base that you currently have? Because I can imagine that's probably a big big topic of conversation around council tables right now. Yeah. So, I mean, I serve on the Federation of Canadian Municipalities Board of Directors as well, so an FCM. So our biggest policy push, like kind of our evergreen one that we've been working on is a municipal growth framework that can properly reallocate responsibilities and funding. As a municipality, we are responsible for 60% of the infrastructure. We get about 10% of the tax. So we do not have enough money to build everything and service everything, even though other levels of government might like to think we can. Um, so we need a new agreement that would give us like there's many different solutions, like give us new taxation powers, give us one percent of the GST or HST. Um, but we definitely need something that we can rely on. That's not the property tax base, because that's 63 percent of our budget right now uh, for revenue. Um, and then on top of that, I think and again, I don't know how popular it is, although we'll see. Um, well, I actually think it failed at Senate, but I think a universal basic income would solve a lot of our problems like our problems right now are economic and it's poverty related. I don't know when it became not sexy to talk about like the war on poverty or trying to do poverty alleviation. I haven't heard that term come out like very often recently, but that's really what we're talking about. Like people struggling in schools, people can't make rent, people can't eat. So they're getting unhealthy and they have to use our healthcare system. It's poverty. Like we need, people need to have enough money to rent somewhere, to eat, to be safe and to go to school. And we would see like almost a I, I don't want to say elimination, but a drastic reduction in all these other issues we're trying to put band-aids on. So I, I don't want to burst Carol Sab's uh, bubble here, but the new fiscal framework would have to have the federal and all the provincial and territorial governments come to the table and have that discussion. I know I've asked Scott Moe, Premier of Saskatchewan, he's in favor of it. Premier Daniel Smith says, no, that's not going to happen. Ontario, I have not heard anything from Doug Ford. Uh, we just have a new premier in New Brunswick. So this is not going to be fixed tomorrow. It's just not. So yeah. what does the city have to do in the short term until that conversation hopefully takes place in 2025? We continue pulling out our first aid kit and taking the next strip of Band-Aids <laughs> off the list. Because, again, is that what it is right now? Is that literally what yeah. all you're doing? Yeah, I, in my opinion. we So we have a plan in London called uh, Health and Homelessness. We're trying to do, I think it's fabulous. So it's hubs. So the idea is people who are chronically homeless, they go into these hubs and then they can stay for like, you know, a month to six months. And then we can transition them into either highly supportive housing if they need wraparound supports yeah. or we transition them into an apartment if they can live stably on their own. And we're building 600 highly supportive uh, units. We're about like 150 on the way there. And then we're building 3000 new affordable units. So we're trying to create this pipeline where we recognize we've got 2000 people sleeping on uh, like on the street or in their car or on a couch. And we need to like work them way their way through the pipeline to get them properly housed. But we've been at it for like a year and a half. And um, we've probably helped like maybe 100 people, which is amazing. It's phenomenal. It's great results. But to be able to scale and to deal with it in a timely manner, which is what I think people want us to do, we need money and we can't pull that all from the property tax base. Like we 
we are we already went up uh, 8.7 percent last year on people's property tax we're probably going to go up around 7.5 this year so that's 16 percent in two years that's pretty significant for somebody who's on a fixed income um so we need the province and the feds to either figure out a new fiscal framework or give us more money i'm fine with either i don't care but one of the two one of the two um okay there's two things i wanted to talk about but you you just said 16 percent. that's that's a hard pill to swallow potentially or 15 percent property tax increase of over two years looking at the services that you deliver uh, i can imagine you want to help people because it is an economic hard time right now people out there are struggling but you still need to supply the services when you go into that budget season right now, which I'm assuming you're already starting, or if you're halfway through, depending on where you are in the process, is this year probably one of the hardest years you've had over the two years that you've been on council? Well, so we actually do a four-year budget in London. So we already know, we have like rough estimates. Um, so 8.7 last year, around 7.4 this year, it probably go up 5% next year and then 6.5 the following year. So it's actually a 30, over 30% increase in four years. Um, London does have some of the lowest property taxes. So okay. London, Windsor, Chatham, Kent, we're at the bottom. Um, Chatham, uh, Kent, woo! Yeah, woo! <laughs> Allison um, Story, hi! <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, so we're near the bottom. Um, but at the same time, it's still a lot. Like, yeah. in, at this in this day and age, it's a lot. Um, so yeah, every year budget season is tough. I think also strong mayor powers have added a layer of difficulty because essentially our mayor puts out his budget and then we can amend it, but we need 10 out of 15 votes. So two thirds, um, that's really tough to get 10 people to agree to, uh, a sign- you know, whether you're adding a lot of money or taking a lot away, it's a, it's a tough spot to be in. Um, so a lot of it is somewhat out of our hands, but I'd say last year was really rough because I was uh, setting the four years. And for example, the police came in with the largest budgetary asset I've ever had. So 672 million, uh, in London over four years. And last year it was 5% of the 8.7%. So if you took away the budget ask, it would have been, uh, was that 3.7, but literally the police added 5% to that increase. Um, and my issue, again, I uh, appreciate the service that the police officers provide to the community, but I find we're spending money on them because we don't have effective mental health resources or housing resources. And so we send police officers to deal with those issues and they're not equipped to it. It doesn't actually solve the issue. So I worry we spend money kind of like in a, a self-fulfilling prophecy. We're going to have to spend more money because we haven't solved the issue. We're just sending people to go and talk to homeless people and Um, Of course, they, you know, again, like there's lots of different things that police officers in London deal with. But uh, we had the chief come last month to speak to council and at least 40 hours every day they spend on mental health calls. So. Which I think Mm -hmm. is why it's that that's massive and I can't imagine anyway. Um. I don't want people to go away from this conversation thinking that there's only issues and challenges in the city of London. So I've got to flip the script for a few minutes before, Thank you. We, before yeah. we start wrapping Please up do. here. Please because yeah. because I, 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 I'm a municipal follower and I follow a lot of news and it seems like only the negative things are that make the news these days. But there's good things that are going on from your perspective. What, what's the city doing right right now? Is there something that you look at when you talk to your FCM colleagues or AMO colleagues that you say, you know what, we're doing this good? Mm-hmm. I mean, again, I'd say the hubs and homelessness plan that we have or health and homelessness, it started uh, two years ago with uh, 60 different agencies getting into one room, including the city and then all the social service agencies, developers, businesses and saying, we need to do something about homelessness. And then they developed what we call the whole of community response. And so that's a strategy that they all endorsed and came up with. I'd say that was super unique to get that many different actors in the room and agreeing on something at the same time. It never happened before. Um, so I think that was exceptional. We're still, again, rolling that out as we have funding to do it. And then I'd even say in London, um, 
the neighborhoods are very strong. Um, and I, I don't know exactly why, but for example, this past weekend uh, in Old South, they had Halloween in the village. So Wortley Village is in my ward. Halloween in the village essentially is a one day event that the community organizes. And there was like a Halloween parade, there's booths, there's a haunted house, there's activities at the library. Um, it's all free and it's all organized by, by the community. So uh, I think there's stuff like that you know, probably again in every city, but in London, especially, there's um, really strong connected neighborhoods that have a lot going on and a lot to give. Um, so I'd add that as well. And what else would I say? Um, we do pretty well with our environmentally significant areas. So again, I got involved in politics because I wanted to see more climate action and more um, efforts being addressed to environmental initiatives. But London, when you look at us across southwestern Ontario, because it has been so deforested and um, wetlands taken away, London has 12 environmentally significant areas that people can hike through and go through, but are fairly significant. Um, and I would give us like two thumbs up for that because there are a lot of cities that have none or they have parks, which are nice, but they're not like habitat, you know. So London does a good job of our ESAs. Where in the community do you go? Is there a spot in the community that you can decompress and just let it all go? We often talk about tourism on this show, and I like to find out where your tourism spot in the city of London is. Is there a mm. spot that you can just decompress after a long day of council or long day of being mom? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm blessed to live in the Coves neighborhood, uh, which is in my ward. And it's essentially, it's one of our ESAs, but it's um, an oxbow that's broken off of the Thames. And so it's three ponds in kind of the shape of a heart. And there's hiking trails along it. Um, and right now the fall colors are epic. So I will go for a walk in the Coves and there's always great blue herons. Um, there's usually those white egrets. There's tons of birds to look at. Uh, and you can almost imagine that you're not in a city anymore because it's like big enough that um, and far enough away that you can't really hear the traffic. So that's where I go at the end of the day. And I'm lucky enough. I literally walk out my front steps and then I just go down the path. So. Wow. Um, so I, w when doing my research on you, I, I found an interesting tidbit that I have to sort of po uh, poke the proverbial bear a little bit. But on the City of London's website, it says you are a board game fan. And your yeah. favorite board game is Wingspan. I've never played Wingspan, but what what's your last game that you've played? Because yeah. when I looked when I looked it up, I literally went to try and buy it. So I will be yeah. buying Wingspan because I'm a board game fan, and my husband hates that about me yeah. because I oh. never play. With, I just buy them and I never play them. But what's the okay. newest game we that you play? play? We'll play yes. when we're in the same city. Um, yeah. so Ottawa FCM next year. There we go. Uh, Wingspan's great. So if you're a birder, it actually, the art is epic and the birds are real birds. You learn. You're like, oh, it's a dark eyed junco. So it'll be good. Although maybe in Calgary, no, it's for all of North America. Um, the one I last played was Sushi Go. I played that like last weekend. So it's a game, you can constantly change the components, but you're essentially putting together sushi platters. And then you get points on like, you know, if you have so much, um, like sashimi, then you get the most points. Or if everyone puts down miso soup at the same time, it cancels each other out and you don't get any miso soup. So that one's fun. It's quick. It's a quick game. Yeah. Okay. Well, but there's I'll lots. To... I'd say my other favorite, so Wingspan, it will be, I think, my perennial favorite, but I also like Terraforming Mars. So. Ooh. <laughs> yes, okay. So we're going to like see if we can book a room and get like all the counselors who like board games together at FCM next year. <laughs> because Perfect. I, feel I think like there's that. a lot. <laughs> there you go. Um, before I let you go, and I appreciate you did <laughs> divulging that information to me because I just, I'm a board game fan. When I found that out, I knew I had to ask about the board game. Um, yeah. Last question before I let you go, because I am cautious of time and I know you're a busy counselor, but in your opinion, what makes the city of London such a unique place to live, work and raise a family? Mm. Mm -hmm -hmm. I think that because it's almost like its own island in southwestern Ontario, you know, it's two hours from Detroit, two hours from Toronto. It feels very much, in my opinion, like um, a small city that got big by accident, but then has all these neighborhoods and still has a city vibe. We have transit. We have great library system. Um, we have a downtown. But then we also everyone has their own little neighborhood. So in, in many ways, it feels like um, very like 
we're an island unto ourselves, although of course we have local areas that are partners. But I think that's what makes it a bit unique is it feels like everything you do is important here. And I don't know, I'm sure it feels like that for everyone, but somehow I feel like that's a little bit different where we're, we're not really part of a region, we're a single tier municipality. Um, and we're trying to solve a lot of the same issues a lot of other places are, but we we really kind of rely on our neighbors to do it. And when I was working at Queen's Park, I think your population at the time was about 350, 400,000. You're over half a million people now, aren't you? If you do the greater census area, London proper, I think is like 430, 430. Okay. Um, but we're adding like, you know, 20K a year, I think. So we'll be over half a million for London proper very shortly. Well, Councillor uh, Skyler, thank you so much for sitting down with me and talking about yourself, talking about board games and talking about the City of London. Uh, I'm looking forward to coming back again next summer because actually in a few weeks uh, time, because I have a wedding down in Welland. So I'm flying into L London. So I will be there in a Great. few weeks time for a wedding in Welland. So I appreciate so much you taking time and doing this interview with me. My pleasure. And thanks for interviewing lots of people because I enjoy listening. Thank you so much for tuning in for another episode of Cross Border Interviews. We hope you've enjoyed today's conversation with London, Ontario Councillor Skylar Frank. Now, if you haven't already, be sure to hit that subscribe button so you never miss an upcoming episode of Cross Border Interviews, Municipal Affairs, or even the Political Trenches Local Government at Work. Your support helps us to continue to grow and bring you more important conversations like you heard today. So stay connected, stay informed, and we'll see you next time here on cross-border interviews. Till then. <laughs>